and one of those places I want to try fishing from a boat. I don't think I've been out more than once here, and that was fishing for Xander. I've never been float fishing from it. That's at Berry Hill Fisheries. Now they've got a boathouse here, nice traditional wood building. I'll tell you what, if you're a fisherman, there's just something about boathouses, isn't there? Of course, I've got my own boat, High Sea Drifter, for shark fishing and stuff. It's still nice to get out there on the water in a boat. Now they've got a little old sign here about the boat hire. Let's take a look at that. Hopefully you don't fall in the water at this early stage. There's all the regulations, do not use the boat without permission. Blah, 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 do not more anglers already fishing. Keep 25 yards from all banks. Uh, all fish, all sounds good to me. Especially the unhook all fish bit. We've got to catch a fish first. Let's get loaded up. The boathouse itself has several boats there, punt shapes, and you can on the bank see these strange green mushrooms growing every now and then. When the carp are biting, they're the carp anglers, and they are sitting there day and night till they catch carp, and it is very good for carp there. Berry Hill Fisheries is a traditional, I want to say it's 300 years old, but you know somebody's going to email us in and say it's 298 years old, Graham. Look, whatever, it's a traditional old English estate lake with a silt bed to it. Beautiful surroundings. I mean, it, to be honest, guys, it's well worth a day ticket to find somewhere like this. It's a rarity these days to get a day ticket. So I got my boat there, which I'm Laid, well, I'm ladling all the ground bait and everything in there and camera equipment. It's a good job they take quite a bit of weight. And I'm not going to go down there. I'm going to first, before I even leave, go into the tackle shop. And yeah, well, I've got to get a little bit more information from Dave. So before I go paddling off in that boat into the uh, wild horizon, I better ask Dave in the tackle shop where he thinks I ought to go. Welcome to a boat fishing expedition here at Berry Hill. Um, it's fishing well at the moment, so you should uh, encounter certainly some cooperative bream and amongst the bream there seems to be the odd tent swimming about which are giving themselves up. So hopefully you'll encounter both of those, a carp would be a bit of a bonus. But as for your trip out there into the lake today, it's plenty of room, it's a 12 and a half acre estate lake so there's plenty of room to obviously fish from. A couple of nice swims I suggest you can fish, just referring to the map to clarify for you. Here we are in the boathouse, all the boats are moored up here. The first one I'd probably target, straight out in front of you on the end of the island, nice quiet spot, always a lot of bream and tench and carp hopefully swimming about in the middle of the lake here. So I'll certainly start there and even pre-bait on your way through. Then we come up to an area called a jungle. That's our most popular area and we try and restrict anglers at the weekend to go there on a regular basis because there's no bank anglers at all over there. This last peg here and one here are the last chaps that can fish from the bank. So once you get up to this big stretch of the jungle, uh, you're full of trees, reeds, bushes, real lovely holding spot for a lot of fish. So perhaps you, once you've done that bit, more up in the open water is quite as satisfactory. And just fish down the middle, bream should come your way quite easily, and hopefully a few bonus tench as well. Okay, as for hook baits, pretty straightforward. Good old humble maggot, always is very successful. I certainly take maggots, worms, either dandrobinas, small red worms, even a section of lobworm would work, and obviously a bit of ground bait would add to it and improve and enhance the swim. Here you can see the island which Dave suggested that uh, I actually anchor or moor up close to. I wanted to keep well away from the carp anglers as well because they obviously have leads flying about all over the place. But you can see the boathouse there. I guess it's a quiet little paddle across there to get to the area Dave said. I didn't go down the jungle but listen, I'm in the right spot. Now what I'm going to do is put down a float marker here. I measure off the depth of a piece of fishing line and I've got a fishing weight on the end of that. So I've already dropped it over the side of the boat where I want to mark a swim or a sort of designated area. So I'm gonna align the boat where I want this within about two or three rod lengths from where I can cast to it. I'm gonna put the marker down. It's not going to cock up vert vertically. It's just gonna lay flat. I'm then gonna drop one cylinder of weight here. This is like a plastic drain pipe full of concrete. I'm gonna 
come about two or three rod lengths away from where I put the marker in, drop it down and just put the ring on the clip there. Now, you're obviously going to be drifting at an angle, so it will pay you to go down the other end of the boat and just gently paddle one end around so it's square to where you want to cast because I'm going to be float fishing. When it's broadside to the swim, I lower the other weight over the side. Don't tie it off so tight that actually the weight of the boat will lift it. Just leave three or four or five inches of slack. Here's the ground bait, which is regular Screttin's pellets. I guess those are probably four mil ones. That's the one I use, standard ones. And any other bait rubbish I can get in there, bits of casters, bits of maggots, chopped up worms, anything at all, because I'm just having a regular day's float fishing in the boat. I've got there, that's going in as well, my trusty garden piece. Some of you will have seen the garden piece where I actually pasted the carp in one of the uh, other lakes here at Berry Hill Fisheries. Mix in a few more pellets, just get them damp. You don't have to get them really slop, sloppy, just so that they bind together. And then get yourself ready to get that bait in the water. Going to be fishing with just two different baits, worms and maggots. I put three maggots onto my float rod there, which is a 13 foot match rod. A waggler float goes out. It's shotted so that there is most of the weight is under the float. I then put the rod tip under the water, sink it and wind the float back into position where I've put that bait. And you're just gonna literally sit back and wait until the fish move into that area. There's the floats, there's the marker. There's another float to the left. So I'm basically three feet to the left and to the right of that marker. And the idea of having the swim markers is if you're in a boat, you don't really have any, I don't know, I'm gonna say reflections or landmarks to cast against. It's very easy to bait up one area and then float fish another and you won't catch as much. Wherever you throw the bait, that's where you want the float. And it wasn't long before I was in action on one of the float rods. One of the most common species in Berry Hill Fisheries is the bream. Large bream, small bream, small bream we call skimmers, large bream that need a net like this, I call bream, bream bream. Good sized fish, that's predominantly what the match, match anglers catch when they uh, have regular matches there. And they are a really a good sign, once they've moved into the swim, there's a very good chance I'm gonna get more fish. I don't bother with a keep net, no point, just get that bait back in the water, get those floats out there, and there's nothing really more satisfying than seeing that float dither, flicker, move sideways, or just flash under as you get a bite. Less and less anglers today seem to go float fishing, and yet years ago, especially on an estate like, uh, uh, lake, lake like this, it was absolutely the way you would go fishing. We rarely did any ledger except for the carp. If we wanted to catch what I call regular silverfish, bream, or even tench, it would always be the float rod that did the damage. Well guys, the wind's been up and down. I've got those two bream, my God. No, I think, yes, something bizarre has happened. Oh, I lost it, I lost it. Oh, no. It's your fault. You know, it's all your fault, you YouTubers, making me catch these fish and lose them. If I was concentrating, I would have lost that. It's probably another bream. So I've had two bream. I think the guys in the bank are uh, catching the old fish too. Not on the cart there. Seem to be pretty dead. That was on worm, by the way. I'm bouncing between the two, and I'll just show you how I'm baiting up. I've got on the rig, two match rods. I've got six pound line straight through. Regular trusty old reel, you've doubtless seen it here many times on the show. One of these modern clear plasticky waggler things here. 
won't say the name because they don't do us any favours. This is a loaded one and it's got a locking shot either side. In fact, I'm going to nip that up a little bit, that slip on that strike. I've plumbed the depth and I'm over depth to allow for the wind. And then when I get down here, I've got a hook link, which was, I think I haven't got it to show you. It's about a 14 hook barbless. Then about a number six or a number eight shot there, just to anchor that just on the bottom. So when the float drags, when the ripple does come up, it drags, it doesn't go right under it. That should just slow it and it stops it pulling out the swim. But I believe the fish have moved in there now. And what I'm doing is I'm fishing one with worm with the Denver beaners and one with three maggots on. I've had one bite. I think that was a worm I just lost on there. Just like this, let me show you. Bring that down a bit. There, you should be able to see it now. Look at the state of those nails. I've been fishing with lugworm again. Actually, I was carping yesterday. Right, I just roll that one round and I always pop it up over the eye or the spade. In this case, it's a spade. Just so that being barbless, if anything does decide to wriggle off, and they will wriggle off, then I've still got something left on there. A little piece of bait. You're okay with an eyed hook and barbs, but spade ends, let's chuck those in. Oh, you can see that there, guys. Look how they wriggle. So they're gonna go out on one float. I'm gonna fish a worm on the other one in the baited patch next to it. Out to the right side. Oh, I should be a match, man. That's an unbelievable cast. Push the rod top under the water. Just let it settle. A couple of fast turns now and then, you know, a few seconds. Don't pull it out of position. Now, what I recommend is just shaking a yard, not even that, two feet of line off, to allow for that yawing, we call it, swinging backwards and forwards on the anchor rope. Otherwise, as the boat moves, it's going to be pulling the float under, and it's quite annoying because you keep striking, thinking it's a bite. Okay, same thing with this, guys. A loaded waggler here, locking shot either side. I'll tell you what they are. They are number eights. That's the locking shot. Just going to shake this line free. Every time I do filming for you guys, something bizarre happens. Just in case it goes. Same, absolutely exactly the same principle. Ah, oh, Mr. Boy. Put the glasses on, mate. Oh, on the camera. Get away from the marker. Get away from the marker. Oh, my God. I told you, every time I switch the camera on and start talking to you guys, something bizarre happens. I dare say it's another skimmer. It's a netter. Well, they've obviously moved in over that bait now. That's the right-hand side. I've been pumping more maggots on that side. Not a big fish. Look, it's not a big fish. But it's boat fishing. Let's just show you this one. There he is. And what's wrong with that? What is wrong with that? Beautiful setting. Beautiful surround. It's a lovely sunny day. Slime up the line. Yuck. That is the downside of bream fishing. Okay, kids, I do urge you to get one of these just gorgeous they're cheap they're plastic you can get forceps as well get, get both pair of curved forceps but listen what you do is if that hook is in the fish's mouth there's a little slot in there you just put the end of the plastic cone in the slot the line through the slot slide it down till you feel the bend of the hook then pop it out and it comes out like that it's dead easy to use and probably get two two or three i would because i'm always losing them anyway i'm going to get this out and i will get around to showing you how to bait that worm up there's so many there. Do you know what they're doing? They're actually bumping the marker float. I've got to get a bait in the water. Especially while this wind's down. Okay, here we go. This is a tub of small dendrobina worms purchased from the very tackle shop that is by the boathouse. Now, when you look in there, you think you've just got a little tub of dry peat, but if you dig around in there with your fingers, you'll find lots and lots of small worms. Or you should do, and they'd be chilled because they've been in the fridge. Now, I hooked them once, leaving about a half inch clear what well, I call the top or the head. I then re-hook them again further down about twice and I think that's important if you're using a barbless hook because otherwise a worm may well wriggle off the hook but as you can see there by leaving the head free I've got a wriggle at the top and a wriggle down at the bottom. So any fish out in that swim have every chance of seeing that well they're going to smell it basically, basically I suppose they're going to smell it. I overcast the swim in this case if it's not accurate, wind it straight back in and send it back out again. You want accuracy when you're float fishing 
from a boat. So try and get it right, three feet either side of the marker. I don't want to go too close to it because if I hook a fish, it could tow me around the marker and then I've got big problems. And that's the other reason I just use a small weight for that marker. If I use a heavy weight, I might lose a fish around it. If I've got a small weight, if I do get a take, then I can at least move it. Now I've got two match rods. One's an old fashioned glassy soft sloppy one which I like and I've got a lot of fish on. This one is a, I say modern, it's 30 years old. It's very tippy and I've noticed it's very good for flicking out wagon floats. Absolutely no question. It's probably a better faster action rod. So sink that line, one or two turns. Just shake off a, about two, two feet of line just to allow for that swinging of the boat. Here is what I do. Now you can get two types of dendrobenus, guys. You can get, if I can fish one out here, the large standard one. Let me show you what the difference is. And I'll get you the small, you can actually now, they seem to be doing small dendrobenus. And one I used to go to Ireland catching lots and lots of bream. Small brandlings were the business. So there is a small dendrobena, hopefully you can see it. And there is a standard one, a lot fatter. I think you see the difference there. This one, I believe, is, you'll get bites on this one, but on small hooks, you're going to miss them because they get buried. The body actually buries in the hook. So I feel with small hooks, like I've got 14, probably the smaller worm will be better. If I start getting bites and missing them on there, on the big worm, I'm going to go for a bigger hook. 12, 10, something like that. Don't worry. Those bream are out there and they're feeding. A 10. It's not too big at all. Well, it was just as well that I didn't go down to the jungle area that Dave pointed out, because you can see after I've zoomed into that shot, tucked in there on the right hand side are a couple of anglers also fishing from one of the old Berry Hill boats. And on the left hand side, when I did my full zoom on the boat, you think, hang on, what's that guy doing around there? He's up to no good, he's actually float fishing. No, he might even be doing some good. But he's tucked in there, he's almost, almost, well, you can't even see him, can you? If I start putting the zoom back on the camera, look how well he's tucked in there. Now, I always wondered, should you go out in the middle and cast into the jungle, or put your boat in the jungle and cast out into the open water? That is the magic question of fishing. Okay, here's that small dendrobena on the hook. I go through them three times, once at the top, once in the middle, bring the hook out, and then just nick it at the bottom there. And that leaves quite a bit of worm around there. And I find just let that float slide away. Once it's out of the, not, don't strike it dithery bites. Oh man, nearly got it again. That's on the maggots. Don't strike on dithery bites. Let the float absolutely slide away, pause a second and just lift into it. That's how I fish worms anyway. I don't like fast striking with worms. You miss quite a few fish. They're tugging at the tail or something like that. Once they get feeding, they will really get hold of it. And of course, the other thing is, when you're shot in that float, just make sure you do allow for the weight, especially if you're fishing what's called dead depth where the worm is just barely on the bottom allow for the weight of the worm as well because that will sink that waggler then up comes a ripple and you go I can't see the float and you end up striking thinking you're missing the fish and you're not actually the float is then overshotted with a big worm possibly better to undershot a little bit so you can allow for the weight of the bait that goes for any bait lunch or meat anything like that man I hope this wind stays down now when you're float fishing with worms Especially this sort of distance, I don't know, 20 yards or so, you can't really catapult the worms out. You're better to cut them up with a pair of scissors, and you can get special worm scissors if you don't want to keep snipping away like this. I've not seen them yet, but I've been told about them. Mash them all into a little bit of ground bait, like soaked up two mil or four mil pellets, 
make them into a little ball and you can throw them out. You need something really weight to get that worm out there. But personally, once you've got the feed out there, maggots, four mil pellets, something like that, they start feeding, they seem to take that worm even individually on its own. But I'm going to spray a little bit of extra bait out after those fish. What we'll do at the moment is a good sort of pouchful like that, half a pouchful, pouchful I suppose that would be of four mils. Try and keep them. The idea of putting the marker float there is to give you accuracy in a boat which is moving and pretty well has no background to it. You know, you've not got shadow lines, like if you're fishing off the bank you've got trees and things. This way you've got to use that marker float so you know you're pretty well within a couple of feet, hopefully, of the baited area. And don't bait somewhere that you can't reach when the wind gets up. A bit more out there. If there's a shoulder bream there, they're really going to pace that bait, so don't be afraid to put some in there. They're not going to follow up with maggots. Like this, good half a pouch full of maggots. Now they're going to cast at a different velocity, a different density than the pallets. Plus I need to give them a little bit more of a plug. Punch it out there a little bit. And they will spray in a wider arc. They tend to go out like that, so i will have to try and keep them within about a three foot area at this distance anyway. And of course the duck's there, what can I say? Ready for action. Here we see guys on the bank, they have an enormous landing net and they're getting a the fish. I imagine it's a small carp in there. Can't quite see much splashing, all looks very casual to me. They're waiting for the fish to come up near the net and I'm doing the best I can. Yes, there is a fish in there, 10 times larger than the net. No, it looks 10 times smaller than the net. But nevertheless, it shows you you can catch some fish off the bank as well. Not even sure that one was a small carp or a bream. It looked too small to be one of the Berry Hill carp because they do mostly seem to run in low double figures, mid double figures. Some good fish there. And there you go, some other anglers just going back to the boathouse. On oh, guys, I switched the camera off. Let's just adjust that for you. I switched the camera off, <laughs> looked up and thought, there's something missing. The left hand float, and I think this is the one with the worm on. It's going to be a perch. No, it is indeed. Another bream. That's literally, literally 60 seconds after I catapulted that extra bait out there. Just a tad bigger, this bream. Not a huge fish. Nice on a match rod. This one's a little bit better. I'm going to show him to. Oh, yeah, this is better up here. That's more like it. That's a proper green, what I call a proper green, this one. That's nice. That is nice on a match rod. A little bit of sport. There's the worm. That's a small dendrobina there. You can see you scoff that. Keep an eye on this other float. I think the fish have really moved in on me now. And that's one of the advantages of boat fishing. You can get out and fish places that maybe the guys on the bank can't reach or they can't get to. And that is really nice. And it's not exactly unpleasant. A sunny day, wind's died off. We'll get many days like this in England. Let's get this guy back. Get that hook out. Hopefully. Well, I can't really tell you which bait to use. It doesn't make any difference. It's worm and maggot. Both are catching. Brilliant. What a setting. Well, guys, I've had those bream. And it's definitely gone off now. I haven't had a fish about an hour. The wind has quartered right round. And that's put sort of subsurface drag into the float. I've moved twice trying to put it right and it's not working. The fish have gone off anyway. So hopefully you got a few tips there on boat fishing. Get out there, give it a go. It's relaxing. You can get fish, you get some really good fish sometimes. But more important, you're your own boss, you're your own captain. So get out there, give it a go and look at the setting I'm in. Okay, so the fish have stopped biting. I'm not giving up just yet. 